Greetings and welcome. My name is Ryan O'Rourke and I truly hope you find the light in today's demonstration. Now if you have any questions or inquiries regarding today's tutorial, I implore you to send me a message either on Facebook or leave your thoughts in the comment section down below. Now all of that being said, let's begin. We are going to begin our Winter Wonderland painting by working on the buildings themselves. Now generally we start in the very back of the painting, which would mean the sky. However, I want to layer a good portion of the sky over top of these buildings. So really, we are still starting with the thing that is going to be in the back because everything is going to be layered on top of it. Now I'm painting a lot of these buildings in just rectangles and squares at this point. I'm not adding in any detail, I'm just trying to ensure that I have a consistent color and texture for all of my buildings. And I'm doing this by having a fairly large amount of purple at the top and then as you get to the bottom, it gets to more of a uh, darker color because the shadows of the other buildings are being cast upon them, creating darker bottoms. Now as we get closer in the forefront, I'm adding more color into the buildings. Here I'm adding a bunch of yellow, red, and a myriad of other colors. The whole idea is that as you get closer, the sky isn't engulfing these buildings as it was prior, and so as a result, you get a lot more color out of them. And it's all still very muted because it is our background and I do want the sky to stand out much more. So I'm ensuring that there's a lot of gray in the purples and in the forefront of the buildings as well. Now you notice that I initially layered on those edges of the, of the uh, side railings of the buildings. And I did that for a number of reasons. One, to add a little bit of architecture into the buildings. And secondly, just to ensure that I knew where my windows were going. By initially putting in these little lines in the buildings, I had a much better idea of the angle in which all of my windows would be perched. And by the way, I'm using a very, very small brush to do these windows. I want to make them fairly exact, but at the same time, they're in the distance. They'll be a little bit blurred out. So you don't have to worry too much. This can be a time consuming process. And ensuring that every window is the same color can be kind of detrimental to the painting actually. You want a level of inconsistency within the colors of the windows. And that's why you have yellows, oranges, a little bit of green, because not every light in every home is going to look the same. Some of them are going to have blinds and you'll notice that some of the windows are actually missing. And I think that is necessary just to show that it's not super artificial. I mean, perhaps it's nighttime, a lot of people are up, but not every light is turned on. Not every window is going to be open. So, with that in mind, you also notice that the windows in the forefront are much brighter than the windows in the background. And I did this intentionally to ensure that, again, when I make sure that every one of these buildings in the background are getting lost in the sky, I don't want the windows to pop too much. I still want that level of depth. And so your windows are going to get slightly less bright as you get into the back of the painting. Now, again, we're working on a building in the foreground and so I'm not using as much purple. I'm using some, but there's a lot more brown and yellow within it as well. But of course, I'm also keeping it consistent with all of my grays because again, it is in the background. You don't want it to be heavily saturated. You want everything that is going to be most vibrant in either your sky or perhaps your main subject. And in my painting here, I kind of went with a split with it. Now, although the sky and the atmosphere is going to be purple, you'll notice that I am trying to incorporate a lot of other colors because there I had a yellow, I had a green, I've had reds, and you are just, you're trying to keep it very diverse and interesting like that. And that can really aid your painting in giving it a more 3D appeal. And when you're only using a couple colors in the color spectrum, you're really limiting yourself. Now at this point here, I'm just adding snow to the tops of all of these buildings. It is a winter scene after all. And I actually started without the snow and I do this quite frequently when I'm working with snow. I'll draw and paint everything I need to and then I'll add the snow on top. And I'm using a fairly watered down white for the snow and I'm just going over the tops of the edges to make them sharp and then I'm kind of blending it down, kind of dissipating the opacity of the paint as we get lower. So from there, I'm going to work on the sky, and 
The sky isn't going to be orange, but I placed a large portion there because I want an orange to show through. I want a warm color in that vicinity. And you notice that I'm making my sky various colors. I had the orange, I have a pink, I have a purple and a blue. Creating a real gradient can create a really interesting sky. Now you'll notice that I'm covering a lot of the buildings here and I'm using a lot of water when I do this. I'm ensuring that I'm creating almost like a fog effect over everything and that is so important. You want to ensure that the paint itself isn't so thick that you won't be able to see the buildings in behind. Now I'm also using my fingers a lot here because it's very water I, I can paint with my fingers and that can be very effective. Now at the top you'll notice that it was very dark for a second but I added a lot of grey. Again this is in the background and I'm trying to ensure that it's not too heavily saturated. I'm also using my uh, brush a lot, a very small brush, and creating little dabbing effects within the sky. This is to add a little bit of extra detail. Perhaps it's fog, perhaps it's smoke, it could be clouds. There's a lot going on and it makes it a lot more interesting rather than painting the sky with one really large brush and just getting a consistent look. No, by using a smaller brush and ensuring that you get little strokes within it, you can create something much more interesting. And so now you notice that, again, the sky is a lot of colors and the whole idea here is that there are different things emitting light within this city. The city has a myriad of things that are going to change a color and so that's why I was doing that. Now there you'll notice that I added on some snow by sprinkling it with my brush. I'm just using a very watered down white and then I'm peeling back my brush. I'm letting it go and then it creates almost a star effect. But here I want it to be implied as snow. And so I'm just continuously doing this. I'm not putting on a lot all at once. I'm doing it in a lot of layers. And this is imperative to ensure that you don't overdo it. And that's something that I'd advise with a lot of painting actually. Go in and do the least amount possible and then add onto it slowly just to ensure that you don't overdo. It's very easy to overdo but you can always add more. It's much more easy to add more than to go back and fix. So here I'm just drawing in different things that I want within the foreground which involves trees and a bridge. Now the trees in the background that I'm working on here You'd think trees as being green, but they're still existing within this very purple area, this purple universe. And so because of the atmosphere, because of the light surrounding it, because it's at night, these trees aren't going to look green. Because of that, I'm painting them in a lot of, uh, I apologize, vertical lines going upwards. And I'm using a lot of gray and purple. I want it to match the surrounding area. And I'm also painting the ground that color as well so I can go back and add the snow on top of it. Generally you want a darker layer on the bottom and then you build on top of it with a lighter layer as I just did. Now for the snow I added it was both a purple and a blue and a white. That is not both, that is three. <laughs> but from there I'm working on my trees and I'm doing this in a lot of tapping and dabbing motions. I'm starting on both sides of the tree and then I'm working my way into the middle. I'm doing a lot of dragging up with my brush and I'm ensuring that different areas are left out of each tree. This gives it more of a realistic look. You want to ensure that it doesn't all look completely consistent. And so I'm also ensuring that on occasion I'm putting strokes that are also going up and flipping in bell shapes on the tree. You want a lot of the areas of the tree to look very different and you don't want them to look the same. And so it's important to remember that. And by the way, when I'm adding on the white on the tree, generally it's very thick at the tip and then as I bring it up, it loses its opacity and it blends into the tree more, which is more of a black and a green in the forefront. Because it's in the forefront, again, you recognize its natural color much more, where the trees in the background are much more of a purple. Now here I'm just adding some lights to go around the bridge. Now the base of the lights is an orange and a red. I do want to brighten that, but again we're starting with our darkest color. And that darker color in the light is going to be a red. So now I'm working on the snow, and by doing what I'm doing, I'm creating hard edges on one side of the snow, and then I'm blending it backwards, and then eventually I'm going back and I'm softening the hard edge. This is going to create a lot of layering effects, it's going to create a lot of inconsistency, and ensure that it looks fairly natural. 
because people will be walking on it, snow will be moving it around, it's not going to look completely flat. You want inconsistency and movement within that snow. So in this tree in the forefront, you'll notice that I'm using that same technique where I have white at the tip and then I blend it back, but at the same time, I'm also doing it downwards in the middle of the tree. I'm creating more incon inconsistency, making it more interesting. And here I'm working on the water or ice, if you will. Now, I'm using a lot of grays in it, but I'm taking all the colors from the sky because it is going to be a reflection primarily of the sky with the bridge as well. And so, I'm ensuring that the middle of it is a little bit brighter, the edges are a little bit darker, and I'm doing it all in a horizontal stroke. For this, I'm using a lot of water on my brush, and I'm trying to make sure that it all looks like it's almost moving or glittering upon an inconsistent surface. And so what that means, it's going to look much more impressionistic. It's not going to look very real. You want it to look like it's flowing or moving and this reflection isn't going to be uh, uh, an exact replica of the top. And then I'm going in, I'm taking white and I'm just edging in everything around the snow, around the rocks, around the water and ensuring that they are properly separated. From there, I'm going in and I'm adding more trees in the background. I'm just trying to expand the painting and create a little more interest within it. And so from there, I'm also going to add a Ferris wheel. Now at the top of said Ferris wheel, you notice that my blacks and my whites, they get much more drowned out. And the idea is that they're getting higher in the sky, which means they're being affected more by the clouds, the smoke and all of that. And they're kind of getting lost. So you'll notice the bottom of the Ferris wheel is going to be much darker, it's going to be much more prevalent, but you also need to ensure that there is snow on that Ferris wheel. Everything you paint is going to be affected by the same environment, which means it's all going to have purple in it, and it's all going to have a lot of snow covering it. Now here I'm painting the seats on the Ferris wheel, and here's a good time to mention perspective. You notice the seats that are closer to us on the Ferris wheel, they're much larger, and as they get farther back, they get much smaller and the whole idea is that when things are closer to you they're going to look a lot bigger and so that can be portrayed in this and you can also achieve much higher levels of depth by ensuring that the chairs in the forefront are more vibrant than the chairs in the background so there are all of these little atmospheric things that go into it that can really create a lot of depth in your painting now here I'm just going back and I'm ensuring that things in the forefront are as dark as they need to be and things in the background are as desaturated as they need to be, which means adding blacks into the trees into the forefront and adding grays into the uh, trees in the middle ground and even the background. You'll also notice that everything gets more detailed as we get into the forefront. The trees in uh, that we can almost touch they're very detailed, they have a lot of intricacy, but the trees in the very background, they're just implied. You don't actually see what they look like. They are just a bunch of little triangles perched upon a rectangle, if you will. It's quite simple, and that's an important note, that you don't always have to complicate everything. Things in the background are meant to be blurred. They are meant to be much more simple. And it's okay to keep them that way as long as you ensure that the foreground and the front of the painting has enough interest in it to keep and maintain your attention. So, all of that being said, I'm just doing another tree here, again, using white at the tips of the branches, and then I'm blending it back up into the black and the green. Now here I'm just making the sky a little bit more subtle, blending in grays, and I'll go back and I'll do that a couple more times after this tutorial is finished. I hope you enjoyed, and if you have any requests or questions, let me know. Here also I'm just adding more snow as we were doing earlier by the way. Thank you so much for watching, I truly hope you've enjoyed and again if you have any questions or inquiries regarding today's work or anything else you've been working on, please feel free to leave me a comment, send me a message and you can actually send me your work on my Facebook page where I'd be more than happy to provide for you a constructive positive critique where we can just talk about art. It's a friendly creative space and I welcome you to join me there. Now that being said, if you look in the description of this video you will also find a link to my mailing list and upon signing up for that you can receive free real-time videos, extra tips, tricks, videos. There's a myriad of things to explore and I hope to explore them with you. 
Now, if you'd like anything specific done tutorial-wise, please let me know. I'd take requests and I'd be more than happy to help you in any way that I can. Now, all of that being said, I'd just like to thank you for taking the time out today, watching this with me, spending the time here, hitting that like button, that subscribe button, leaving a comment. Every little thing you do here, it matters, it matters immensely to me, and I just can't tell you how grateful I am. So thank you and have a wonderful day.